morning, everybody, again. How y'all doing now? Yeah. What a special time in worship. What a special time in worship. You guys, I love that. I do want to remind you, if you need freedom, if you need a Savior, I got a chain breaker. His name's Jesus Christ, all right? So if anybody here doesn't know the Lord, and you want to come talk to me about him, or one of the elders about him after the service, we love to talk about Jesus. That's all I pretty much talk about, that fishing, and that's pretty much it, right? All right, good morning, you guys. Um, I want to start today with a question, one that might lead to some debate in the church, some that I hope to cause several arguments during your lunch dates today, okay? I want to see some fighting, just don't hit each other, all right? All right I want to ask this question, which person knew Jesus better than any other person who walked the earth? Anybody? God? Okay, well, that's an obvious answer. I love that answer. Where, there's the Sunday school answer. Which person knew Christ better than any other man that walked the face of the earth with him? John the Baptist. John, his cousin, John the Baptist. Thanks, Kemper. You just ruined the whole sermon. No, uh, no. We're not talking about the Baptist today. How about this? We always forget one person that spent more time with Jesus possibly than any other man. A person who, who worked with Jesus in his profession. A person who built homes with Christ. A person who grew up with Jesus Christ in his house. His little brother James. Anybody? We, we always forget about James, don't we? I will tell you why. Because within many denominations, they've tried to erase James. Why? Because in some denominations, the Virgin Mary cannot be the perpetual virgin if she had kids with Joseph, right? Right? So we've wiped out James, and we call him like this weird half-brother, you know? He is a half-brother. He's just a brother from the same mother, amen? Different daddies, right? Different daddies. Now, as in Jesus' father was whom? God, all right? So I have this question for you, though, you guys. We know Jesus had uh, four brothers and a couple sisters that were the product of a normal relationship between Mary and Joseph. Of course, God gave them that permission. He just said, wait for Jesus to be born. But I want to ask you guys this. Who here in this room has a younger brother by show of hands? All right, who here has an older brother? Anybody, right? Okay, lots of us, right? I have a younger brother, you guys, and I know I say this all the time, but he is my favorite person in the entire universe. What's his name? Anybody remember? You never listen to me. Dougie. My brother's name is Dougie. You guys would have to call him Doug. I love this man. He's a man's man, and he's got my hairline, so we're homies, okay? But I will tell you this. We grew up in the same home. We learned to walk on the same floors. We learned to camp, fish, and hunt together. We dealt with the same crazy parent drama in our home. And, of course, we grew from young, pubescent boys into somewhat fully developed men together, right? The same is true for Jesus and James. Do you guys ever think about that? I mean, Jesus' siblings would have lived somewhat of a normal Jewish life in comparison to Jesus. And we often overlook that. But I want to ask this, you guys, what kind of stories would James have about Jesus if we could talk to him? Has anybody in this room ever wondered what happened to Jesus before he was 30, by show of hands? I would really love to hear some stories about Jesus as a 13-year-old going through puberty. What was he like? Well, he was perfect, so it's probably pretty boring, right? He studied the Bible and built stuff, <laughs> you know? But I would really love to hear some tales or some fables about Christ. So... The truth is, um, who knows some stories about Jesus? James, right? But I will tell you, as, a, as an older brother, I witnessed a lot of things from my messed up little brother, okay? He did a lot before the time he was 30, uh, you know? And there are some things that I will never tell another soul. There are some secrets about my little brother that I will take to the grave with me. Anybody got any of those secrets? Y'all are messed up. All right, so... How about, like, this story, <laughs> right? Uh, when we were in elementary school, uh, my little brother hid a leftover sparkler from Fourth of July. Well, my little brother decided it would be a great idea to light the sparkler in our bedroom. And I will tell you guys, you may not know this because smart people use them where? Outside. But they produce a lot of smoke, okay? And our bedroom quickly fills with smoke and my little brother is running in circles screaming holding his sparkler like I don't know what to do right and he's losing it and I am no help I'm frozen in fear I'm baffled by the stupidity I see unfolding before me so he panics and he comes to the brilliant decision on how to distinguish this sparkler he decides to use our bedroom carpet to do so 
brilliant plan, and the carpet engulfs in flames. He finally comes to his senses. I, start out, I stomp out the carpet. He runs to the bathroom, throws it in the toilet. Interesting truth. Sparklers kind of stay lit in water for a little bit. Burn the toilet, right? And so here I am as an older brother. I have this dilemma, right? Like, uh, what am I supposed to do, right? What is a responsible older brother to do? My parents are going to come home. They're going to find the burn mark in the carpet. They're going to probably blame me because he's going to be crying, you know. So what am I supposed to do? Well, I did what any responsible, loving, older brother would do in that situation. I hid it from my parents, and we never told them, okay, until we went to move out, and they found the burn mark we hid under our Lego toys, all right? But <laughs> built a castle over it. It was a brilliant strategy, okay? They never looked under the castle, all right? But I will, I will never tell my parents what happened. I'm a vault. I keep secrets unless my mom watches this on YouTube, right? <laughs> but anyways, I was wondering, right, like, if, if I was to write a book about my brother, there would be some stories in there, amen? There would be some stories about my little brother, and I'm sure he would have some tales about me. So if James were to write a book, what wonderful, fabulous, profound stories would we see of the life of Christ within that book? And as we know, James did write a book. You guys know what it's called? the book of James, right? They keep it pretty secretive, you know? And, and this is written by the brother of Jesus. And I don't know about you guys, when I was a new believer, I was really excited to read this book, right? Like, what am I going to read about the life of Christ? Well, uh, we are going into a new series on the book of James. And we're going to answer the question over the next several weeks, what do we see from the brother of Jesus in the book of James? And we're going to call this series The Practical Life. The practical life. And why are we calling it the practical life and not the life stories of Jesus? Because, well, James writes exactly zero stories about the life of Jesus in his book. Instead, he writes this wonderful little book chock full of practical life application for believers in Christ. Lessons I think we all need to hear and heed today. Amen? So we're going to hop into the book of James. But we're going to answer this question within the book, the first chapter, chapter 1. How can I test the maturity of my faith? How, how can I put my faith to the test? Who here wants to grow in their faith in the Lord? Okay, if you're not, your hand's not up, I'm concerned, right? Like, you should want to grow in your faith, and the question is, how do I do that? Well, James is going to tell us you need to put it to the test, and how do we put it to the test? We're going to see that in this amazing chapter, but first, before we go into the Word of God, will you guys please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your wonderful Word. Thank you for the writings of James. Let it open our hearts, let it transform us where we need to move, and let it speak to us where we need to hear you, Jesus. It's in your name I pray. Amen. All right, James 1. Uh, we're going to start in verse 1. We're going to end up in verse 8. If you guys have your Bibles out, will you please read with me? It should be on the screen. We open with a greeting. James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Highlight that. To the 12 tribes of dispersion, or the 12 tribes of Israel that have been broken up by their being conquered by Rome. Greetings. Testing of your faith is the title of the next section. Count it all what, church? Okay, we're going to get to that. My brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces what? Circle it, highlight it, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in what? Nothing. Nothing. Man. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it'll be given to him. But let him who ask in faith, but let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that type of person, or that person, must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, circle that, unstable in his ways. So right off the bat, we see this super powerful language from James. James says, a servant of God. The word in the Greek here is doulos. Everybody say doulos with me. Doulos. 
If somebody has Google on their phone, could you type in this word, D-O-U-L-O-S, doulos? What does doulos mean? If I was at a younger church, this would be done already. In my high school ministry, the kids were on it, baby. Anybody? Kemper, help me. I'll wait. I'll have some coffee. <laughs> you know what? You... Thank you. Who said that? I love your whole family, all right? Blessings on your children, okay? Well, most of them. Anyways, right? So, doulos literally translates to slave. James, don't miss this, James just called his big brother his master. Show of hands in here. Who would call their big brother master? (laughs) He's here, he's here. You're not a slave to your, no, you're not, all right. I can tell you one thing for sure. My brother would rather eat a box of razor blades than call me his master. Amen? (laughs) If I said, call me master, it'd be a fight to the death with knives. All right? My brother would never say that. But here's why this is surprising, you guys. Here's why this is so shocking. James never considered Jesus Lord when Jesus was still on this earth. You guys need to know that. Jesus' family didn't understand that he was God, as a matter of fact. Jesus' family, his mother and his brothers, try to interrupt his ministry when it starts to turn the world upside down. You guys remember in Mark 3, Jesus is being followed around by these huge crowds, so much so he can't even make it to eat. And Jesus' moms and brothers show up at his house, and and they try to seize him. And what do they say? Send Jesus out, because he has lost his mind. Do you guys remember that story? Even his own family didn't know why he was here or what he was doing. But now we get to this section of the Bible. And James is calling a guy he used to call his big brother master. And we have to ask, why? Why? How does he go from a big brother to master? The only reasonable answer is James experienced the risen Christ. Amen? Like, you guys need to know this is one of the biggest pieces, if not the greatest pieces of evidence for the Christian faith, that Jesus died and the grave couldn't hold him and he came back to life. Amen? If you're doubting who Jesus is, look into the resurrection. And I promise you, the evidence found there will change something in your heart. Sermon over, have a nice day. No, I'm joking. All right. So, something happened to James. We believe he experienced the risen Christ. Now he calls him master. That's awesome. Verse 2, count it all what? Ooh, this is tough. My brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces what, church? Steadfastness or unmovability. Is that a word? All right, church, can I just be honest? Please don't judge your pastor, but I decided to preach on the book of James. Because my brother-in-law is in prison. You guys don't get it. Okay, he's in prison. And he has read through the Bible a couple times all the way through. Because let's face it, all he has to do is do push-ups and read the Bible. Amen? And he accepted the Lord in prison with me over the phone. It's one of my... Sorry. It's one of the greatest days of my life. And he read through the Bible, and he came to James, and he said, the book of James is awesome. Zach needs to teach this in church. And here we are. (laughs) I allow convicts to sway my preaching. Please don't leave. Okay, so, but what I will tell you is, when I decided to teach on the book of James, I forgot that it started with the idea of suffering. Can I be honest with you? As your pastor, I'm sick of preaching about trials. Kind of over it. But for one reason or another, you got to know something about your pastor. I come to a book and I just teach it. I don't run from it. I just teach it. And suffering keeps coming up over and over and over. It's almost like suffering is going to be a part of our faith. It's like this reoccurring theme in the Bible. So here we are. And James goes into a depth of suffering that's just crazy. He says, consider it all joy, all of it, when you experience trials of many kinds. As a matter of fact, other translations say, Consider it what? Pure joy. Like refined gold when you suffer. Let's just be real, church. This is insane, right? Why do we not really agree with this? And most of the times, why do we not, like, live this out? Because no one experiences suffering from God and goes, heck yeah, finally suffering God. Can I have some more, right? It's about time this showed up. I've been waiting for it, you know? 
right? No one does that. No one in the middle of suffering looks at Lord and the Lord God and says, please, sir, may I have some more, right? Nobody does that. Why? Trials hurt. Trials are suffering. Trials, by their very nature, are what, church? Unpleasant. No one likes pain, unless you're weird, right? Unless you're a sicko. So, how in the heck can the brother of Christ, James, consider joy in all suffering? Well, the answer is very clear. We can find joy in all trials when it produces something valuable, amen? When it, when it makes something valuable as a product of that pain. We go back to these words, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. I love this. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in what, church? Nothing. Let this suffering bring you closer to the perfected person that is found in Jesus Christ. Quite literally, we can rejoice in trials because the pain of those trials make us stronger. The pain brings us closer to perfection. It will prepare you to stand your ground in your faith when everybody around you is moving. I can tell you some of the things I experienced as a kid and some of the things I watched my wife experience as a kid we thought would break us. But now my wife's a Terminator, yo. Like, she can stand up to some things. I will tell you those sufferings we now see as a blessing because they made us who we are. Is there anybody else in the, in the church like that? Anybody else who can say that that suffering made them a stronger believer? Anybody who can stand here and say, try to move me now. I've been through this. Amen. Anybody? Am I alone? Let me make this really simple for you to understand. I've been, I, I brag about this all the time. I should probably stop, but I've been going to the gym with Tyler for one year now. Can you guys tell? Oh, yeah. yeah, okay. I have to wear loose shirts or they tear off up here, you know what I'm saying? But I've been going to the gym with my son for a year now, and I have to admit, don't tell my son I told you this, but it is probably one of the favorite parts of my life. Because I get to go to the gym and he's forced to talk to me for an hour. Right? He has to talk to me. And we get to talk about his girlfriend. Hi. And we get to talk about all sorts of stuff. And, and the best part is I get out of the office and I can avoid Terry, right? It's my favorite part. Um, so, <laughs> I'm sorry, Terry, I still love you. you that was mean. All right, so, uh, anyways, we go to the gym. And, and I, can, I can tell you this, that I love the gym, but there's one day in the gym every single week that I hate, I loathe, I avoid it like the bubonic plague. If Tyler didn't make me do it, I would never do it. You guys know what it is? Leg day. Leg day is the worst. Why? That picture's not supposed to come up yet. You're ahead of me. Get it too late. All right. So leg day hurts. Every leg exercise is painful. You grow your legs by tearing your quad muscles so they rebuild and grow again. So most men skip leg day and we just do arms all the time. And women are backwards. Go to the gym sometimes. You guys will see this. Ladies will have these huge legs and these itty bitty tiny arms. I don't know what's going on. Like, we need to, like, put men and women together to make one complete body, but we don't. And you will go to the gym and you'll see these guys with these massive upper bodies and these tiny, teeny, skinny legs. They look like a potato with toothpicks sticking in it, right? And they can just push them over and their legs would snap. But why? Because leg day hurts. Leg day is unpleasant. Leg day is uncomfortable. But we go through the pain of leg day. Hear me on this. Don't lose me. Because if you don't, you'll never mature properly. You'll literally be a half-formed body. Man, what a good illustration, right? But hear me on this. Please don't miss this. This is a perfect illustration for some people in the Christian church. They keep, they keep skipping leg day in the faith. Why? Because every time a trial comes along in their church, they run from that church. Every time pain and suffering comes along, they flee. And they never reach the perfection that Christ has for them. Why? Because they keep skipping out on what is unpleasant. They run, and they never get the blessed opportunity to develop. And their faith stays untested and unformed. So this brings us to our first answer to that question, how can I test the maturity of my faith? Number one, you guys have to be willing to face trials if you want to test your faith. If you want to mature in your faith, if you want to grow in your faith, you're going to have to be willing to face the trials that come 
your way. Don't miss this. If you want to grow in your faith, if you want to become closer to Christ, stop running. Stop running from churches. Stop running from pain in the body. Stick around and grow. We're going to come back to that, though. We're going to come back to that. Here's the second part of this. How can I test the maturity of my faith? Number one, be willing to face trials. Number two, be willing to pray for wisdom about what's coming in your trials. Let's pick up in verse 5 in your Bibles. If any one of you, what? Wisdom? Lacks. I'm glad some of you with me. If any of you lacks wisdom, highlight lacks, underline it, circle it. It's very important. Let him ask God who gives generously without reproach. I don't even know what that word means. It'll be given to him, but let him ask in faith without doubting, with no doubting, for that one who doubts is like a wave in the sea driven and tossed by the wind. See, James seems to change the subject matter here. He goes from trials to praying for wisdom, but I need to tell you guys as your pastor, you should know these two are directly connected. What is going on here? James is saying, if you want to be able to face trials, going to have to pray for some wisdom in those trials. Does that make sense? If you're going to face the pain coming your way, you're going to need to have wisdom about where it's coming from, who it's coming from, and how you should respond to those trials. God, you're going to have to ask, God, do you want me to face this trial, or do you want me to avoid this conflict? You guys should know sometimes people were out to hurt Jesus and his disciples, and they didn't stick around to get beat up. Amen? Sometimes they remove themselves from a dangerous situation. Other times, the disciples of Jesus were beaten up, stoned, and thrown out of a city, and we see them get back up and walk right back into the city. You guys remember those stories? Why? Because in their wisdom, they knew God wanted to produce something from that danger, from that abuse, from that pain. We don't go through life as believers looking for suffering. We suffer and remain in trials when we believe that those trials or what God desires for us to face. But let me put it more simple for you guys. I don't want to miss this. Some trials are self-inflicted. I can't skip over that. Some people make unwise decisions and end up bringing pain upon their lives, and then they try to call it a trial from God. Hear me on this. If you cheat on your wife and your whole world falls apart, that's not from God. That's you, bro. That's you. You made your decisions. You brought those on. Those aren't trials. Those are consequences. Can I hear something from the church? <laughs> However, if trials come your way that you didn't create, you're going to need wisdom to face them. And don't miss this. You're going to need wisdom to look to see God's hand in everything that's happening. You need wisdom to understand how God is asking you to grow in that trial and in this pain. James goes on, though, but let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. James is clear. If you ask for wisdom from God, he's going to deliver. Amen? Amen. Not if you ask for anything from the Lord, he's going to deliver. Please don't miss this. But if you ask for wisdom from the Lord, he's going to deliver. But he says, don't doubt that God's going to deliver. He's going to bring it. And then he goes into this analogy about the sea. Have any of you guys ever been in the open ocean on a boat? Anybody been on a cruise? Okay. I spent two years on the ocean, not time to brag, I'm just better than you guys. Okay, but I'm on the ocean, and on the ocean, when it's smoother, you can see a wave form in the distance, and you can see it travel, like, off into the far distance without breaking. But when it's stormy, when it's windy, we get what we call mixed seas. Have you guys ever experienced mixed seas on the open ocean? It's terrible. I have never been more seasick in my life than when you experience mixed seas. It's swell waves and wind waves heading in opposite direction. It makes no sense. It's mixed up. So what is James saying here? James is saying, don't ask God for wisdom and then look to the world for wisdom at the same time. Don't be a double-minded man. Either take the wisdom of the Lord or take the wisdom of the world, but don't mix the two up because you're going to be really messed up. So he's saying, pray for wisdom from the Lord and trust that he is going to deliver. To deliver. But I have one more thing to say, and I don't want to miss this, you guys. You might pray for wisdom, and that's a very, very dangerous prayer. Because sometimes you pray for wisdom, and God sends you trials to grow you and to bless you 
and to refine you. But I have to tell you, if you pray for wisdom, sometimes it hurts, amen? But you need to remember your prayer. Let me give you an example. <laughs> I made a terrible mistake about a year ago. I asked God to mature me and make me a head pastor. <laughs> Big mistake. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, and, and, and understand something, like being a youth pastor was tough, yes, but solutions to being a youth pastor, solutions to youth problem, pastor problems are easy. If you have a problem as a youth pastor, turn up the bass, buy some more pizza, okay? It's done. <laughs> Fixed. It's hard to complain to the pastor when you have cheese pizza crammed in your mouth, okay? But I will tell you there's problems in the adult church that you can't fix with pizza. There's not easy solutions. And I find myself facing trials in the church, and I keep asking God for wisdom. Lord, do you want me to face these trials? Do you want me to avoid these trials? Are they self-inflicted, or do they come from you? And what are those trials? We've had some change in this church, haven't we? Not everybody's amening the change. You guys remember when I first took this job, I stepped up on the stage. And I said change was coming. And I asked who is going to stick with me when things get hard, when things change. And you guys remember most of the people in this wood stood up and you guys cheered. You guys remember that day? You stood up and you cheered with me. You welcomed the change that was coming. But here's the problem. The change is here. And it's not going anywhere. Amen? Change is uncomfortable. Change brings about a certain level of pain, especially for those who are comfortable with where they are. You guys, now we're facing a new trial in this church. People I thought would be with me in the change, the, the older, the more mature people in the church, have decided that the discomfort's not worth it, and some of them have walked away. People I thought would stand with us. People I thought would fight with us. I've been the first people to turn and run. And I can tell you that is so discouraging as a pastor. And I want, I'm telling you why this is discouraging, because I know that they probably ran from their last church when things got hard, and then they got here, and they're going to run from this church when it gets hard, and they'll get to their next church, and when things get hard, they'll turn tail and run again, and they're never going to grow in their faith. Amen, church? They're never going to stand still long enough in the pain to let God form them into fully developed believers. They're always going to skip leg day. They're not growing because they keep skipping out on the pain. And we need some steadfastness. This is what steadfastness is, church. What is steadfastness? Steadfastness is standing still when everything's moving around you. Picture a boulder in the river. The boulder stands still and the stream cuts around it, right? But I will tell you this. I heard a saying from a very intelligent young man. Oh, no, wait, it wasn't an intelligent man. It was Gary, right? No, it was Gary. Gary said this. I love you, Gary. The measure of a person's spiritual maturity is not measured by how much they're going to do for Jesus or how much they're doing for Jesus, but how little it takes to stop them from doing what they're doing for Jesus. You know, church, some people have been proven pretty easy to stop doing what they're doing for Jesus. Guy wears a hat on stage. I'll stop coming. You change the worship music. I'll stop coming. Pastor won't preach for 55 minutes to an hour. I'll stop coming. Some people have proven to be too easy to move. But i got to ask you, church, maybe God's bringing trials along because as your pastor, he's asking me, the people in this room, our leaders, to stand firm in trials and grow up a little bit. Amen, church? Maybe he's calling us to stand firm in the battle, to hold the lines, and to develop into perfectly formed believers in Christ. You guys know there's this movie have you guys ever heard of Braveheart? Anybody seen Braveheart in here? Show of hands. Sinners. Okay, so don't watch it. In this movie, there's this scene. You guys should know, uh, I'm not talking about the typical scene everyone quotes where they have to hold the sticks while the horses are coming. You know that scene? Hold. You guys know what I'm talking about? No. 
In this movie, there's this burly, gnarly, powerful old man that goes into every battle with the young men. And this guy is awesome. Every time they run into battle, grandpa's there chopping people down with him. It's amazing. But then about halfway through the movie, you guys remember the movie, he trips and falls over, and an enemy chops his hand off with a big axe. You guys remember that scene? And you're like, he's done. Grandpa's done. It's over. Play the bagpipes. Start the burial. He is going to meet Jesus. Amen? But if you remember the movie, the next time the war starts, there we find that battered old man. And he has a mace fixed to a chain attached to his stub. And he charges into battle and he starts chopping the enemy down. And then he dies. But we don't need to go into that, okay? But here's the point, you guys. I'm telling you, he made a strong statement in that moment. He said, I'm not going to let these little punks fight this battle alone. I will not let my sons and my grandsons fight the English without me. And I need to ask the older men in this church, are you going to let us young punks fight this world all by ourselves? Who's going to stand with us? Who's going to fight with us? You know what I would love to see, church? I would love to see a few burly old men with stubs for hands standing next to us. Don't let us face these trials alone, church. God will bless this church and do great things if you guys are willing to stand with these young punks and take on the enemy. Amen? Stop running. Stop running. Stand your ground. You guys pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father, I want the older generation in this church to know that they're loved. I want every man and woman in this church to know that they're needed, to know that we can't face this trial alone. God, let them stand with us. Let them hold the line with us. Let us face these trials together. Let it produce steadfastness that leads to perfection in Jesus Christ. That scared me. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen.